In the previous episode, we told the story of the Caucasus, how it emerged from the sea and how it became a geographical crossroads. Due to its temperate climate and diverse nature, Georgia was a convenient living space for ancient humans whose main activity was gathering food. However, over the millennia, people have gradually evolved, refined their tools and armor, formed tribal alliances and states, and started to fight each other for resources. Politics emerged. The Caucasus changed from a mere geographical area to a geopolitical area. The fifth century turned out to be extremely exciting and tumultuous, bringing huge changes in every field. The whole world was in turmoil. The Roman Empire had lost its power. The Roman order collapsed. The great migrations began. The tribes fought and, at the same time, merged with each other. Many ethnicities disappeared and new ones emerged instead. During this global disorder and the cataclysms which were taking place, a new culture political reality was created. This new reality created the basis for medieval Europe and a new world order. It was during this great world unrest that Vakhtang Gurgasali launched a major political economical project. He decided to build a safe highway from Dariali to Khornabuji, connecting the north and the south. The Caucasus range blocks cold air masses coming from the north. That is why there is such diversity in Caucasian nature, vegetation, wildlife, and climate. This is the environment in which Georgia was formed and which led to the creation of a particular Georgian lifestyle. At the same time, the Caucasus served as a political barrier like the Great Wall of China. It protected Georgia from one of the largest catastrophes in human history. The Huns, who inhabited the Asian steppes, were not able to invade China and headed west, where they were destroying homes and killing anyone who crossed their path. The powerful Huns had attempted to invade the south. However, despite several successful raids, they failed to cross the Caucasus. They continued their raids westward and completely changed the ethno-political map of Europe. The Goths, the Vandals, the Slavs, the Alans, and the various Germanic tribes who were defeated and driven out by the Huns fled to the depths of Europe and began to settle there on European lands. Along with the wars, the process of intensive assimilation and cultural integration between peoples was ongoing. As a result, new languages and new nations emerged. It was during this period that the cultural and political shape of modern Europe was defined. Northern nomads like the Sumerians and the Scythians were always attracted to the south because of the warm climate, the regions rich in agricultural products, and the trading cities of the Caucasus. Here is a fact that will help us imagine the scope of power threatening the Caucasus from the north and understand how important it was to close Darbend and Dariali passages. The deadly enemies, the two superpowers of Persia and Byzantium, 
jointly finance the defense of these gates of the Caucasus in order to somehow stop the Huns. Georgia was a member of this coalition against the Huns because the Georgians controlled one of the gates of the Caucasus. It is difficult to say how the ethnic, culture, and political events would have unfolded if the expansion of the Huns had reached the South Caucasus and the Middle East. It is interesting to imagine the language spoken by the Georgians in the 5th century and how successfully modern Georgians would be able to communicate with them. To answer this question, we can read a story written by Iacob Kutsesi in the 5th century. There may be a difference in pronunciation, and we may not understand the meaning of some words. However, it is clear that modern Georgians could talk to 5th century Georgians and fully understand them. This is not an ordinary situation, since there are very few nations in the modern world who speak the same language that their ancestors spoke and wrote 1,600 years ago. The Caucasus is a natural barrier through which two important passages connected the northern and southern civilizations, Dariali and Durban. Both armies and trading caravans entered through these gates. Consequently, these two passages were a source of money and power. Since the transfer of a significant military force to the Caucasus was only possible through Dariali and Durbend, those who owned these crossings controlled the Caucasus and had a strategic advantage in the region. In ancient times, the Caspian Sea level rose in the summer and covered the Derbend exit, further increasing the importance of Dariali. The great empires sometimes created an alliance with Georgia, sometimes directly trying to subdue it. It depended on the existing power balance. Therefore, Georgia's political orientation was constantly discussed in this context. At various times, the Sumerians, the Scythians, the Byzantines, the Persians, the Huns, the Romans, the Parthians, the Khazars, the Arabs, the Ottomans, the Russians, and others fought to capture the Caucasus. Empires changed, but their concerns stayed the same, and the wars in the Caucasus usually started because of Dariali and Derbend. The world in the first century had quite accurate information about the, the Darieli Gorge. Strabo wrote that you have to walk three days from the northern nomadic country, and the path is difficult, after which you have to walk another four days on a narrow footpath in the Aragos Valley to reach a fortified wall. It should be noted that Strabo mentions the Georgian name of the river Aragas. In Georgian, the Terek River was called the Aragvi, and Dariali was called Aragviskari. Apart from Aragviskari, this narrow rocky section of the Terek Valley had different names at different times. The Iberian Gate, the Caucasus Gate, the Ossetian Gate, and the Caspian Gate. Eventually, the name Dariali was established, which is derived from the Persian Dari Alan, meaning the door of the Alans. The territory the great empires needed as a strategic base was, in fact, the only homeland for the Georgians who raised their children, worked, sang, recited poems, made wine, and built their houses here. They lived there. Hence the constant problem of the Georgian state, 
how to control the gates of the Caucasus and the roads crossing its territory. At the same time, the Darieli Gate has always remained the most important political instrument that Georgia used to balance the forces between the empires. The North was not only associated with the threat. The road connecting the North and South was an important political function of Georgia and, at the same time, a stimulus for economic development. The Silk Road was actually not just one road, but a world trade network consisting of numerous routes and branches. It connected the markets of China, India, and Central Asia with European cities. Although the central route of the Silk Road did not pass directly through Georgia, there were always auxiliary routes crossing the country. Due to the demands of the markets or due to political and natural events, these routes changed. There were periods when the demand for the North to South Highway through Georgia increased, which contributed to economic progress and the development of urban life. For the caravans, the safety of the road was crucial importance when choosing the routes. Therefore, Vaktang Gorgasali made every effort to ensure the safety and protection of the caravan routes, as it was the only means of developing the country and its involvement in world economic processes. The safety of the caravan road was ensured by the capacity of these roads and the castles and towns built along it. The founding of medieval cities usually began with castles and walled monasteries. They were usually built on the important roads and crossroads. Here, passengers rested and stocked up. At the same time, artisans settled around the fortified settlements, which facilitated the development of trade. As the city grew, the walls were built around the artisan area. Depending on the size, the city might even have two or three walls. The location of the city had to meet many requirements. It had to be protected. It had to have a water supply. And at the same time, it had to have favorable conditions for agriculture in its vicinity in order to ensure food supplies. The main factor determining the function and sustainability of the city was the road guarded by the city garrisons. At the same time, the city itself was part of this road and trade infrastructure. The large-scale construction of towns and fortified monasteries from Dariali in the direction of Khornabuji, initiated by Vaktang Gorgasali, indicates that there was a serious demand for this highway. We know that a considerable amount of cargo was transported through this road, leaving a significant income in the state. Let us say a few words about these cities. It is interesting to know what they were like and how people lived there. Due to historical cataclysms, there is no medieval Georgian city preserved in its original form. With only ruins and drawings, it will be difficult for an inexperienced person to restore the real picture of what the everyday life of the cities was like. The famous Georgian historian 
Ivan Javakishvili left us an important study of urban life in medieval Georgia. It gives us a clear idea of how a typical Georgian city was set up. Due to economic demands, the fortress cities were built at such a distance from each other that the caravans had no difficulty carrying large supplies for long distances, and the garrison stationed in the town was there to rescue if pirates attacked them on the road. The Deda Tsika, or main citadel, was located in the middle of the city. A settlement was formed around this citadel, surrounded by a wall. Thus, the city was a place where people from nearby villages took refuge during times of wars. The established rule was that only those who took part in its construction and fortification had the right to take refuge in the fortress city. Merchants and artisans lived and worked outside the city wall near the defense structures. These were blacksmiths, builders, carpenters, tailors, bakers, and many others whose professions were needed by the city and the daily changing caravans. The streets in the cities were paved. The central government cared for intercity roads and bridges. As David Agmishenabeli's historian tells us, the king built many bridges over the fierce rivers and paved the roads. The city was a center of trade and industry, and it needed appropriate infrastructure and institutions. Citizens traded in the markets and squares, and shops were lined up in the streets. Additionally, there were workshops of blacksmiths and tailors, wine sheds, and so on. There was definitely a scriptorium in town where books were copied and papers compiled. There was a butcher shop and also an oil shed where they made and sold walnut and flaxseed oils. The latter was produced in especially large quantities. Of course, every city had flour storage and mills. First of all, the city needed water, which was piped into springs in several places in the city. There might even be pools. Places with water shortage are very rare in Georgia, but in such places, rainwater was collected in reservoirs cut into the rock, which held water for several months. Of course, there were various entertainment venues in the cities, and bigger cities also had racetracks. In every era, there were some people who had problems with the law, and such people were placed in city jails. There were hospitals in cities and in large monasteries. Usually, wealthy people donated money and food to the hospitals in order to help the sick. In the 12th century, King David Agmashenabeli of Georgia built a hospital in a beautiful location and with a beautiful climate. He personally checked that it was clean and in order and that sick people did not lack for anything. The righteous town people did not leave out the poor. There was a special shelter for the poor in the cities where poor people would find food to eat and a place to sleep. This was what the old Georgian city was like. 
with its buildings, buzzing marketplaces, the sounds of workshops, and a thousand. Every day, a new caravan arrived in the city. There could be more than 300 people in the caravans. Additionally, there were pack animals and saddle animals, camels, horses, mules, and donkeys, which were probably several times more in number than the humans. Receiving and hosting so many people required relevant experience and a well-maintained infrastructure. This was under the care of the central government. A direct road from Tbilisi to southern Georgia was built during the reign of female King Tamar. There were taverns along this road so that visitors were able to spend the night and get some food and drink. Such a well-maintained infrastructure guaranteed that the caravans brought money into the state budget. This also contributed to the strength of the state. King Vakhtang Gorgasali is associated with many historical events and legends, but his main merit is that he formulated and embodied the concept of economic development based on the geographical premises of the country. This concept meant a balance between danger and benefit. On the one hand, he closed the northern and southern borders of Georgia to enemies. On the other hand, he started the grand construction of fortress cities along the road connecting the north and the south. Thus, he made the long highway from Dariali to Khornabuji an attractive route for caravan traffic. Since then, many empires involved in geopolitical cataclysms have disappeared. However, Georgian land still begins in the middle of the Caucasus, in the Dariali Gorge. Below, the Georgian flag flies at the state border checkpoint. This fortress is called Female King Tamar's Fortress. However, in reality, it was built by Vakhtang Gorgasali and it became the main gate of Georgia to the north. The TV caravan of the first channel of Georgia will follow the Vakhtang Gorgasali historic highway from the Dariali Gorge to Khornabuji. We will see where this road led and what it was like. Today, some parts of this road are still used, but in some places only a faint trail can be seen. Many things have changed. However, there are places that have not changed at all since the time of Vakhtang Gorgasali. We will travel through history, we will connect with the past and we will get a glimpse of the future.